morning. So uh, first up, what do you do? Well, you already said what I do. Um, so I do have these two roles within Accenture. So I lead our health and public service business across Canada, across all jurisdictions. And I lead inclusion and diversity for Accenture Canada. Um, I've been in the industry now 29 years. I joined uh, right out of school and, and really all the reasons why I joined consulting are the same reasons why I'm there today. It's really for um, a love of the work that we do. I've always had this great variety of work and variety of opportunities. I have the privilege of working with uh, Canada's leading businesses and governments to solve some pretty significant challenges, so that's rewarding. And I, um, I work with some great talent, and that talent comes from our clients, it comes from our ecosystem partners, it comes from my colleagues at Accenture and Avanade, uh, and it keeps me on my toes. Um, we talk a lot of, at this conference about sort of digital transformation, but one of the things that's really come across in the last couple of years is how much of that transformation, to, to Afro's point, is, is process and it's culture, it's these other factors mm -hmm. that require that change to take place. Um, what does leadership mean to you in a climate where people are realizing it's not like throw a magic technology toy at it, but actually uh, right. produce that? What does leadership actually mean to you? Right. Yeah, leadership is critical in this day and age. And, and when I think of leadership, first and foremost, it's not about a certain position or title. It's really all about behaviors. That's what defines a leader. And um, what we obviously have leaders throughout an organization, and that's important. But the role of leaders re needs to be to, to set a vision for the future of the organization, or even just part of the organization. Uh, really help people um, see themselves in it, so make it more personal, so they can really engage and help drive that vision. And then empower. We just heard the last speaker also talk about empowering your team and empowering people, uh, so they can really embrace change rather than creating this culture of fear. Um, and what we're experiencing is that you know, the traditional leader, um, still valued, obviously, but it was one more based on sort of the science of business, right? It was the leader who is analytical, critical decision making, the person who uh, was focused on outcomes and key metrics, and all of that's still important, but there's really now this human side uh, to the business and, and, and the role of the leader. So the leaders now need to also demonstrate empathy, um, they need to be able to, to actually inclusive leaders. Uh, a lot more self-awareness is required. And, and most of that, I think, is being driven because we are facing a world where, you know, our customers, the citizens, our employees demand a very different experience. Right? How, how is it different? Well, because, I mean, what, what you and I face just as consumers uh, in a commercial world uh, sets the bar of what we expect when we are procuring a service or interacting uh, with different levels of government uh, and engaging with them, that drives our expectations. And the same is true of employees, right? What are they looking to for leaders? So it really is the leaders and the mindset of leaders and kind of bringing this whole brain aspect of leadership um, that drives culture change. So you alluded to the changes in technology and consumer expectations. Um, and as a leader who's more diverse and inclusive and empathetic mm -hmm. and all those other things, rather than the sort of hard science, more of the manager as mm -hmm. a leader, what is it about the rise of technology and consumer expectations that's driving this need for a diverse, inclusive form of leadership? Right. Well, so first of all, um, let's just define the terms a little bit. Sure. So uh, diversity for me is, you know, certainly the makeup, the composition of our people being diverse in all, all the different ways that make us unique. And it's a critical foundation for what drives innovative thinking, um, but it's not in and of itself enough. And that's where we get into what is the environment in which our people actually go to work? And are we creating an environment that drives creativity, innovation, um, that self-empowerment? Do we give people the freedom to actually hypothesize, experiment, right? Sometimes fail, you know, can we avoid, like, how do we as leaders respond when, when failure happens? Um, and then to adapt. And really, as we try then to understand, if you think about products and services needed for the future, you have a very diverse set of, of consumers as well. Um, there was one of my colleagues told a story recently of being in India, 
and they had put in um, a whole new set of washrooms and it was all new technology, simple things really in today's day and age. But what she found was interesting, she herself was the only white person and she, there were sensors uh, for the water and she went to wash her hands and they worked fine, it was all new technology. She then heard those several other team members complaining that the, they weren't working. And what they actually discovered, so she took an actually piece of uh, tissue and put it underneath the tap and the tissue was white and it worked. What would happen? Right? It didn't actually recognize the dark color of skin to right. trigger the water. Right? We have to recognize that the products we design, the services that we provide are there to service a number of different people with different ethnic backgrounds, et cetera. So um, if we're really gonna make societal change through technology, it can't be about what's possible because anything's pretty much possible with technology. It's really about what's valued, right? So what do, do we really understand the problem we're trying to solve and how do we identify problems and then how do we identify solutions actually add value? So um, part of this is obviously retraining leaders and helping them to understand mm -hmm. how to become like this. Mm -hmm. Part of it is, is going to be a regime change or retirement thing and part of it's a pipeline issue. Yeah. How do we address the pipeline so that we're grooming the leaders of tomorrow who can fulfill that kind of role and, and have that perspective that's, that notices the margins as well. Right. So I could tell you what we're doing within Accenture. Sure. Because Accenture is like any other organization. It's a very large global organization. So when you're trying to make culture change, it's a pretty big ship to move. Um, but we're doing that because when we look at our own ambitions to grow and be relevant in our industry and to our clients, uh, we have to recognize that we have to have a talent ambition that supports our growth ambitions. And so we have uh, taken a check on our own, you know, what is our leadership mindset? And we've defined very specific behaviors that we now expect of leaders um, and those leaders of the future. And they're different than when I started 29 years ago. The company has changed. Uh, the culture has changed. When I started 29 years ago, it was a much more centralized decision-making, policy-based, compliance-based, a lot, a lot more risk-averse. Um, today, and it's, we're not perfect, right? There's more work to be done, but today it is a more flattened organization. Um, we are really driving to create, um, encourage people in creativity and innovation, have those internal innovation challenges, uh, the freedom to explore, um, and it, and it comes with a fundamental, what do we expect of the people at the top and how they interact with people every day uh, that's gonna help drive the When change. you say freedom to explore, how do you make sure that people have the ability to make a mistake yeah. and you know be open about, hey, I made this mistake, this is what I learned and not right. do it again, as opposed to like, badge, you made a mistake and punishment. In yeah, so it does come down to how do we respond when those events occur and how does it show up sometimes in a person's performance. Uh, we've even changed our whole talent strategy around how we measure performance and it's much more forward looking around future potential as opposed to, you know, what have you done for me lately or not done for me lately. Um, but certainly our attitude uh, is what fundamentally will drive um, the ability for people to take smart risks, right? Yeah, you can't maybe take every risk, but you can be smart and informed. Um, and yep, we might fail, but I think if we also manage it in sizes, right? And that's where we get into learning, even with our clients, do things sort of in a smaller um, size, test it out, and then when it's demonstrated to work, then you scale. Sure, got it. So it's my turn to get off the stage okay. and let you interview our next guest. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'll be back later. Pleasure. Thanks. So I'm going to ask uh, Sarah Paquette, Executive Vice President for Shared Services Canada, to join me now. Thank Hello. you. Bonjour. Um, so I have a few questions for Sarah as well, also on the theme of leadership. And um, we'll just start with, so Sarah, you have a civil law degree followed by a common law degree, um, and now you're at SSC. Yes. So can you uh, just share, how did you decide to pursue the career that you are working in today? Um, what was your path, and, and how did you even identify the path that you're on? Well, people that work with me know that I always have a plan and a B and a C and a D for everything. <laughs> so of course I had a plan for my life and my career. It just 
that I was open to other opportunity and challenges. So all through my careers, whatever I was doing, if an opportunity was coming up to do something completely out of my comfort zone, yeah. if they were offering it to me, I was not going to challenge if, if I had the capacity or not. You trust me with it, I'm going to right. deliver on it and work until I'm done. And I will bring people around me to help me do it. So that's how I started in a small private firm in Gatineau to join the federal uh, public service, which in my head as a student, I would never have thought to join the public service. Not that I didn't want to, had no idea how to get there. Yeah. And when I went to my first interview, uh, I had all the answer wrong and I didn't prepare because I had nine trials that day. Mm. Not, not that day, but that week. So I was like, okay, I have two hours on Tuesday. Would you do the interview then? And they said yes. And I showed up and I didn't prepare and didn't <laughs> have the answer. Went back to my office and they call and they say, oh, I think you have the personality. We'll hire you even if you were very weak in the interview. <laughs> Thank you. So then I had to learn English because they were bilingual requirements. <laughs> so I started studying. Anyway, they finally lowered the bar for my English because I was not CBC at the time and then started in the public service. But that's just how I did it. You have a plan and then opportunities happen. You look into it and uh, you grow into all those the different opportunities. So that's how I went from being a first level lawyer to uh, being a manager, a team leader, and then uh, the head of legal services at uh, the Canadian Food Inspection and Agency, and after that, uh, Public Works. And then the DM at Public Works said, oh, Sa, you will have a great career in justice. What about you do something else? I said, why not? Sure. And then I became the ADM service. And then ADM service at Public Works didn't talk at all about technology, but then a new deputy minister came on and she said, oh, Sarah, I would like you to do GC apps. Never been done before. I tried 20 years ago and didn't work out. And I said, great, which part of my resume you didn't get? <laughs> and uh, she said, you're able to do it. And I said, fine, I'll do it. And I failed and I learned and I start over. And uh, when Ron Parker came to me and asked me to join SSC, I said, ooh, I'm a woman, I'm a francophone, I have three kids, and I don't speak tech or understand tech. Are you sure? <laughs> and, he, and what is your community going to say if you bring me in? He said, we think you're part of our community. There you go. I joined SSC, and they've been fantastic with me, and I uh, got promoted to EVP. So the reason why I'm the EVP is not because of my technological background or my path that I was planning for myself. It's just about opportunity, challenges, right. and uh, working with people. Right. You raise a, a couple of good points. I mean, why not you? Yeah. Right? We sometimes doubt our own self, but when somebody's asking you, why not you? Yeah, you trust right. me. Why shouldn't I trust right. myself? Right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, good, good. So um, through that leadership journey, can you tell us a little bit about who or what has inspired you, and even now, who or what continues to sort of encourage you and inspire you to, yeah. to press on? What I look for in leaders is that A, they will leave their ego at the door. Mm -hmm. Because if you bring your ego into the room, then there's no space for other ideas. Right. So I look into leaders that will bring people together, hear their voices, have frank debate, and then trust. You know, we had a good discussion, we decided on a path, I entrust you to go and run with it. If you have issues, come and see me. I will remove barriers at my job. Either I get out of the way, or either I help you get there. So that's what I'm looking for myself, and that's what I'm trying to do for my team. But uh, those leaders that look into potential, that they trust their people, and they are really looking to know what they don't know, mm -hmm. and bring team together with different strengths that complete each other, I think for me that's really what inspired me, because I'm always looking for results, and that's how you deliver results. Right, good. So, um, <laughs> so as one of our uh, senior leaders in Canada's public service, uh, what are you experiencing um, sort of as some of the challenges and opportunities uh, in this digital transformation in the public service of the future? 
What I think is great about the pace of technology right now is the opportunity to leap forward. Mm -hmm. Having been in the government for 22 years, how many times did I hear, oh, we're the government, we're 10 years behind. It's normal. Well, with technology, you cannot be 10 years behind. So I think it's a great opportunity for us just to leap forward, to embrace the new technology, learn, fail, uh, regroup, rethink, restart, and actually meet citizen expectation. Right. You know, in our personal lives, what kind of services are we expecting from our government? It's the kind of services we're receiving in our personal life. As an employee of the government, what kind of tools do you think you right. need to do your work? the tools you actually use at home to, do your, to deliver on your personal life. So I really embrace the fact that technology is really going to help the government of Canada to be at the forefront of digital, offer citizens what they need, and then offer employees what they need mm -hmm. to, uh, to deliver on them. And to do that, we're all in this together. So it's not about the government, it's about mm -hmm. us, all of us. We need to work together. We need to pull the strengths of the industry build a relationship, work with them in a long-term vision to deliver better services to citizens. So I think it's a right. great opportunity right. we're living right now. Agreed. I mean, I think even when we talk about inclusion and diversity, we seem to be focused sort of on within our own organization, right? But it really, the benefits that, and the reasons why we, we do it extend beyond the, the walls of our one organization to across organizations, right? Across that ecosystem where we can benefit with when you bring together the government, the not-for-profits, the startups, even if those large multinationals, um, you know, the bringing those the thought leaders, the experiences together, I think in the end makes for a better outcome for everybody. Yes, we cannot just say it's complex. We need to start. Right. And where do you start? By bringing people together with all those different backgrounds, ideas, angle, perception, right. or even desire. Yeah. And, uh, and, and bring it together, work as partners. Everybody has to win because it needs to be a true partnership and that's the way we're going to deliver it. And just an example, Forward 50 is having students here. Right. So this is just a great um, leadership to demonstrate that it, we're all in this together. So I, I'm really thankful for them to, to bring all of us together and have this discussion. Well, I know you played a big part in having those students here today, so thank you for that too. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna leave. Lisa's gonna join you, and you can take it from there. Perfect. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Lisa Clarell. She's the Canada Public Sector Representative for Microsoft. I probably miss a word there. No, 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 that's perfect. That's so perfect. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Good do morning. You, do you want to take it where we just left off? What do you think about the relationship between okay. the public sector and the private sector? So I think that's, uh, that's a phenomenal question. So I guess a couple things on that. To give a little bit of context on where my perspective or point of view is, I've been in the IT industry for the last 27 years. Um, I have always in my career partnered with public sector, whether it's federal government, uh, provincial, municipal, healthcare, education. And I think as private sector leaders, when you partner with, uh, with public sector for all your career, I think I always say the P3s. So what, what makes you successful is you need to be uh, patient, you need to be persistent, but I think most importantly, you need a passion. You need to uh, completely have a passion for public service. We as private sector need to respect that uh, it's not just about ROI. It's not just about budget and price. Those are important. Uh, but most importantly, it's about how do we positively impact the quality of life in Canada. And so with that frame of mind, um, to be successful and to build successful relationships with public sector leaders, you have to have that empathy, respect, and, uh, and uh, partnership perspective. I'm just looking at the clock's not running. So, <laughs> you have more time. Perfect. <laughs> I'm going to have to stretch. But the, uh, so a, a couple things. The, I was, this is my first day actually at Forward 50 this week and I've been here for the last three years, it's an awesome event. I get to ask Alistair some questions shortly. Um, but I was watching tweet, Twitter yesterday and Twitter must love this event because everybody's on there so I almost feel like I've been part of the event. And there was one tweet yesterday that said, 
it's not necessarily about digital government, it's about public service reform. And I think when you look at that public service reform, that's a lot to do. That's a lot to undertake, it's different skill sets, it's different uh, minds around the table, and I think the respectful partnership between public and private sector is critical for us all to achieve it. And I wanna thank you, actually, because I think we've got a couple uh, fun little partnerships to do in the marketplace as female leaders in Ottawa to really work on that pipeline of young women in STEM and technology, so yeah, I appreciate and respect that. <laughs> and what about leadership? We discussed it a bit earlier. Do we like? Would you like to add something? Yeah, I have. Uh, I got a few things to add now. Uh, what Claudia said earlier um, that resonated with me was the human aspect. But I'll, I guess I'll look at it from a, a couple of perspectives. One is when I think about technology, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, technology was in the back room. It was behind the curtain. It's really bright people saying words none of us can understand. We've seen costs increase and as business leaders trying to understand and government leaders trying to understand what's going on with technology. I think today it is no longer an enabler Technology is that public service reform and opportunity that we can do. So as leaders, number one, I do fundamentally believe that we must have a baseline in technology knowledge. Um, I understand the Canadian Public uh, Service School recently did a curriculum for the deputy ministers across Government of Canada. We need to do more th of that. I think that's phenomenal. Because I think to adopt and do this digital journey, um, leaders need to know what cloud is don't need to know the wires, but we need to understand what are the pros and cons, what's the technology workforce we need to build for the future in this technology environment. We need to know what data sovereignty is, what security is, what, what uh, data privacy is, and as leaders that's very important. The other part of the technology skills is we need to help our teams evolve their capabilities and their technical skill sets, and you need to make that important. Uh, one of the things we've done uh, across Canada this quarter is we actually, we booked in every single one of our colleagues' calendars uh, over a three-month period, one day a month. Everyone's cleared their calendars, and we're sitting in our own desks or with groups. There's lots of people working together and we're developing our skill sets. And I think very important wow. that we uh, emphasize the importance of that. The, uh, Claudia also talked a little bit, I'll call it growth mindset, is the phrase that we use as an organization. With the world changing so often, I think as leaders, not just the manager skills, those are important, to operate and lead our businesses, but really to lead the future is to have a growth mindset curiosity, to always recognize that you're never the brightest person in the world. It's all about continuous improvement, not staying where you are today. And so that's a tremendous piece. And then I'll, last but not least, I'll say coaching. We call it model coach care in our company. And it's, we're moving away from that directive leadership or measurement and modeling the behavior, coaching the behavior. Our teams are going through change. There's so much coming at us with, with technology. We, we need to provide clarity. We need to provide some focus so that people can uh, develop their own growth mindset. Excellent. And what about diversity? In diversity. In the, the uh, big corporation that was gonna be my like fourth. Yours. But uh, diversity is uh, diversity and inclusion, yeah. uh, absolutely critical. I am, I am extremely passionate about gender diversity, but um, one of the things I love about our company is that we, are, we try to be as in inclusive as possible and we think in so many ways and are continuously developing that. We're not perfect, everybody makes mistakes, but I think it's important to have that focus of, of continuous improvement. So diversity and inclusion means to me race, culture, uh, sexual orientation, uh, disabilities. D um, disability is very interesting and as a company we've been focusing on that quite a bit. So if you look in Canada, we are about what, 6.2 million people in Canada have disabilities. 70% of those are not visible to us. That's almost 17, 18% of our citizens in the country have disabilities. And so when you think about designing and technology, how do you think of those, that's actually a lot of people, but they're out, they're not in that normal curve, they're out here. 
how do you think about designing for those people so that you're inclusive? And so I'll, I want to share one technical design. One of my colleagues keeps bringing this uh, example, and I love it. Think of elevators. Think of uh, the big office buildings in downtown Ottawa, downtown Toronto, and you go to press the elevators now, right? It's really efficient. We've got the technology. You press the pad, and it says elevator B, C, or D. Now, think of that if you have a visual impairment. Think about there are some elevator platforms now that do have Braille or will speak to you and say, uh, go to elevator C, D, or E. But what I haven't yet seen is, great, which one is it? <laughs> when you are, so, the, so that importance, and I'll, I'll say that um, it, it's a lot of fun working with a company that's really trying to look at those people who are excluded so that we can actually figure out how to best include in our technology. Excellent. Okay. And so you're using technology to help them? Are you using AI? Or? Absolutely. Lots of artificial intelligence. And if anybody wants to come to a workshop later on today, I think we've got a team for about two, two and a half hours. But I think the artificial intelligence, the acceleration of technology, makes that responsibility so much more that we design that exclusivity in from the start. Otherwise, it could be dangerous. OK. Thank well, you. thank you very much, Lisa. Good. Thank you. Looking forward to awesome. seeing you soon. Alistair. So Alistair's on the hot spot now. <laughs> That's where I like to live. Good, good, good. So one of the things um, I've learned, so diversity inclusion, very, very important. But one of the things I've learned over the last couple of weeks, I will say you've got a small and mighty team that organizes this event, <laughs> phenomenal and passionate people. Thanks. The, I've recognized that uh, diversity inclusion is very important to Forward 50, and so I've got a two-part question. First is, um, why is it important? What is it that you do? And would love you to give a little bit of context around that. The second part of it is, and I w have been watching Twitter, you've used the phrase white dude uh, on Twitter. I've seen someone tweet that this week, so I'm going to use that phrase. So as we look at diversity and inclusion, Sometimes there can be conversations these days with white dudes feeling excluded Fe um, and that we need to respect that, understand that, would love your perspective on that. What do we think is the role and why is it important to white dudes that diver to embed diversity and inclusion? Let me, let me, let me see how many eggshells I can <laughs> Um So I was raised by my mom, who's somewhere here in the room as a single parent. I have a phenomenal sister and a nine-year-old daughter. Uh, makes it pretty easy to see three generations of that. Um, I think that if you were in a school of football players and half of them weren't allowed to play, and you were doing okay in the local football games, and then you said, all right, we're going to let everybody try out this year, and guess what, you probably do better because the normal curve simply says that now you can sample from twice as big a pool. If you're a white dude, you've probably had an unfair advantage for a long time. It's not that anyone's taking anything away. If you're good at what you do, you deserve that job. If there's someone better than you, you don't deserve that job. Uh, I'll tell you something that, that a VC once told me, and he got a lot of grief for this. He said, I invest in minority and women-led companies, not because I want to change the world. This is why he got the grief, but because women and minorities tend to produce better outcomes as startups, and tend to receive less money. That makes them an underutilized asset, and as a capitalist, that's a good investment. And so people were like, I love you, I hate you, <laughs> right? But the truth of that statement is that, and, and literally, you and I were sitting back there, and I'm like, okay, ask me real questions. I just looked at the lineup. I'm the only guy on this stage today. I but I didn't, re the best part about that is, I didn't notice until I looked at the list, yeah. which is weird. I'm literally the only <laughs> loud white dude yeah. on the stage. <laughs> I, I count as three or four loud white dudes. I'm so loud That's and white. True. That's true. Um, but I think that the reality is that if you're going to, uh, if you have a bully pulpit, it is your obligation to use it for change you want to see in the world. Um, and if you have a, and I, I live in constant fear of doing something wrong. So I'm going to say something that sounds a little maybe risky. Mm. I've noticed that in politics, especially south of the border, um, in certain political circles, for certain political parties, you are bad until you do something good. Mm. You may be someone who's done a lot of terrible things, but you 
do a certain thing that the political group thinks is wonderful, and now you're a hero. And there are other political circles, and I'm not naming names because I want to remain nonpartisan, where you're good until you do something bad, at which point the cancel culture says, we're done, and walks away. And that's obviously a very politically charged conversation. Um, as a loud, straight, white dude, I'll add straight to the list, um, I am constantly aware that, especially this event, lives on a knife edge. We have people making ads for us on Twitter because they love the conference. We have people saying, I want to set up a Reddit or a Wiki. And that's amazing. I've never had that kind of support. But I'm also like, I know I'm one dumb remark or one stupid decision away from that crumbling. And I don't want that to crumble because this is a pretty good community. And I think that you have to say to yourself, it's not that you're in fear of doing the wrong thing. But as, as she was saying, it's about failing openly once and then moving on and, and being transparent. And I'll tell you a quick story about this. The first year for Forward 50, we had a form that required that you enter email. And um, in the email, you, uh, it verified that it was a real email. So if you type in my address, you type in A, and it would give you a message saying, must be a valid email address. And you type in C, must be a valid email address. I got a mail from David Best, who's blind, saying, hey, bonehead, every time I type a letter in that form, it rereads <laughs> me the web page. I didn't know that was the case. That's horrible, right? So I, I'm like, okay, let's not make that a required field. Let's fix that, because I didn't know. And I wrote a blog post about, here's what I learned doing outreach for this. And I think as long as if you're in a position of power, as long as you accept, hey, this is, we're learning, and here's what I've learned, and you share it, then I think people will support you trying to get it right. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that when you get to choose from the whole school instead of half the school, you have a better football team. Yeah. And those people who are on the team, they may have to try out again. Let's hope they're good. Yeah. Good. You did a good job on that. <laughs> Long answer to a short question. But I, I love the, the failing uh, recognition, right? I think the reality is none of us are perfect. All of us are. All of us have our unconscious bias. No matter what our, our great intent is, there is no perfect organization leader. And I think it's that growth mindset of learning and adopting and, and continuous improvement. But but I think there's a risk of being accused of and actually virtue signaling. And mm -hmm. I, like I have a pronoun pin on here, mm -hmm. despite the fact that apparently Twitter knows I'm a loud straight white dude now. <laughs> um, and I have a trans friend. And I said, said to her, like, I'm wearing this pin, but it's pretty clear what I am. She said, you're not wearing it for you. Everyone knows who you are. You're wearing it so that when I wear mine, it isn't weird. Mm. And I think that's a really important lesson, that it's not about, sometimes it's not about you. It's about accommodation. Mm. It's about inclusion. And if you're the person who gets to choose which washrooms are non-binary, you better do that, right? Because the non-binary person may not be in charge of the washroom allocation. These are stupid little things. There are, uh, I guarantee you, for those of you that are here, there are a thousand little things behind the scenes you didn't know are being fixed constantly by a team of seven. I think there's a moral obligation if you have a bully pulpit to use it for the change you want to see in the world. And I think it's really hard to do that without being accused of virtue signaling by people who don't want to give up their place on the football team, shall we say. Good. So I want one last question, mm -hmm. change tax a little bit. So you've been all over the world. You have been uh, talking to governments all over the world. You've come up with this phenomenal uh, environment over the last three years. What worries you the most? What should we be doing more of faster? What, what concerns as we look at how to improve the quality and continue to improve the quality of life for Canadians? Uh, I think that we are, I believe that the big battle in the universe and I do mean universe, like science fiction, Malka older universe, is between individualism and collectivism, like Star Trek's The Borg. Um, we live in a Western liberal democracy where individuals have agency, there is a Bill of Rights, there's a Constitution. Um, the Bill of Rights is there to protect the individual against the masses. We are faced with species-level extinction problems that are better solved by collectivism. And I said this in my Ignite talk last night, we tend to want a hero to come and save us, and then we rally behind them. I read a great post the other day about most of the progressive changes we see in the 20th century are the result of World War II. You have women entering the workforce, the GI Bill, civil rights, all came from World War II. It's incredible. We needed an almost world-ending catastrophe to get our shit together. Mm. We are a sentient species. We gotta learn how to get our shit together without coming to the brink of extinction. 
And unfortunately, we wait for a Greta Thunberg or a Robert Mueller, whoever that might be, to show up, and then we rally behind them. There are other societies where individuals don't have agency, don't have rights, but those societies can say, electric cars now, no more meat today. And I think one of the things I think a lot about is, let's say we all decided, no more meat. First of all, steaks are nice. If I said, no more meat, people would be like, oh, that's horrible. But I guarantee you that within a year of no more meat, first of all, all vegetarian food would be delicious. We'd be growing stuff in vats that would be fine and ethical and sustainable. We view the changes we have to make with the lens of today, rather than saying if we make those changes, how good can the world of tomorrow be? And until we collectively, rather than as some loud person broadcasting, until we collectively say, if we make these changes we must make, how do we then make life better for all, we will fail. So I worry about the need for individual heroes, and I worry about our inability to make decisions about tomorrow based on the lenses of today. Thank you. Thank you cool. for having me. Thanks for doing the panel.